The day after that, all this was in June of 82, the professors had trooped out again in a great excitement. As they passed Ami's, they told him what queer things the specimen had done, and how it had faded wholly away when they put it in a glass beaker. The beaker had gone too, and the wise men talked of the strange stone's affinity for silicon. It had acted quite unbelievably in that well-ordered laboratory, doing nothing at all and showing no occluded gases when heated on charcoal, being wholly negative in the borax bead, and soon proving itself absolutely non-volatile at any producible temperature, including that of the oxyhydrogen blowpipe. On an anvil, it appeared highly malleable, and in the dark, its luminosity was very marked. Stubbornly refusing to grow cool, it soon had the college in a state of real excitement, and when upon heating before the spectroscope it displayed shining bands, unlike any known colors of the normal spectrum, there was much breathless talk of new elements, bizarre optical properties, and other things which puzzled men of science are wont to say when faced by the unknown. Hot as it was, they tested it in a crucible with all the proper reagents. Water did nothing. Hydrochloric acid was the same. Nitric acid and even aqua regia merely hissed and spattered against its torrid invulnerability. Ami had difficulty in recalling all these things but recognized some solvents as I mentioned them in the usual order of use. There were ammonia and caustic soda, alcohol and ether, nauseous carbon disulfide and a dozen others. But although the weight grew steadily less as time passed, and the fragments seemed to be slightly cooling, there was no change in the solvents to show that they had attacked the substance at all. It was a metal, though, beyond a doubt. It was magnetic, for one thing. And after its immersion in the acid solvents, there seemed to be faint traces of the Widmanstatten figures found on meteoric iron. When the cooling had grown very considerable, the testing was carried on in glass. And it was in a glass beaker that they left all chips made of the original fragment during the work. The next morning, both chips and beaker were gone without trace, and only a charred spot marked the place on the wooden shelf where they had been. All this the professors told Ami as they paused at his door and once more he went with them to see the stony messenger from the stars, though this time his wife did not accompany him. It had now most certainly shrunk, and even the sober professors could not doubt the truth of what they saw. All around the dwindling brown lump near the well was a vacant space, except where the earth had caved in, and whereas it had been a good seven feet across the day before, it was now scarcely five. It was still hot, and the sages studied its surface curiously as they detached another and larger piece with hammer and chisel. They gouged deeply this time, and as they pried away the smaller mass, they saw that the core of the thing was not quite homogeneous. They had uncovered what seemed to be the side of a large colored globule embedded in the substance. The color, which resembled some of the bands in the meteor's strange spectrum, was almost impossible to describe, and it was only by analogy that they called it color at all. Its texture was glossy, and upon tapping it appeared to promise both brittleness and hollowness. One of the professors gave it a smart blow with a hammer, and it burst with a nervous little pop. Nothing was emitted and all trace of the thing vanished with the puncturing. It left behind a hollow spherical space about three inches across, and all thought it probable that others would be discovered as the enclosing substance wasted away. Conjecture was vain. 
so after a futile attempt to find additional globules by drilling, the seekers left again with their new specimen, which proved, however, as baffling in the laboratory as its predecessor. Aside from being almost plastic, having an unknown spectrum, wasting away in air and attacking silicon compounds with mutual destruction as a result, it presented no identifying features whatsoever. And at the end of the tests, the college scientists were forced to own that they could not place it. It was nothing of this earth, but a piece of the great outside, and as such dowered with outside properties and obedient to outside laws. That night there was a thunderstorm, and when the professors went out to Nahum's the next day, they met with a bitter disappointment. The stone, magnetic as it had been, must have had some peculiar electrical property, for it had drawn the lightning, as Nahum said, with a singular persistence. Six times within an hour, the farmer saw the lightning strike the furrow in the front yard, and when the storm was over, Nothing remained but a ragged pit by the ancient well sweep, half choked with a caved-in earth. Digging had borne no fruit, and the scientists verified the fact of the utter vanishment. The failure was total, so that nothing was left to do but go back to the laboratory and test again the disappearing fragment left carefully cased in lead. That fragment lasted a week, at the end of which nothing of value had been learned of it. When it had gone, no residue was left behind. And in time the professors felt scarcely sure they had indeed seen with waking eyes that cryptic vestige of the fathomless gulfs outside. That lone, weird message from other universes and other realms of matter, force, and entity. As was natural, the Arkham Papers made much of the incident with its collegiate sponsoring and sent reporters to talk with Nahum Gardner and his family. At least one Boston Daily also sent a scribe, and Nahum quickly became a kind of local celebrity. He was a lean, genial person of about 50, living with his wife and three sons on the pleasant farmstead in the valley. He and Ami exchanged visits frequently, as did their wives, and Ami had nothing but praise for him after all these years. He seemed slightly proud of the notice his place had attracted, and talked often of the meteorite in the succeeding weeks. That July and August were hot, and Nahum worked hard at his haying in the ten-acre pasture across Chapman's Brook his rattling wain wearing deep ruts in the shadow lanes between. The labor tired him more than it had other years, and he felt that age was beginning to tell on him. Then fell the time of fruit and harvest. The pears and apples slowly ripened, and Nahum vowed that his orchards were prospering as never before. The fruit was growing to phenomenal size and unwanted gloss and in such abundance that extra barrels were ordered to handle the future crop. But with the ripening came sore disappointment, for of all that gorgeous array of specious lusciousness, not one single jot was fit to eat. Into the fine flavor of the pears and apples had crept a stealthy bitterness and sickishness, so that even the smallest bites induced a lasting disgust. It was the same with the melons and tomatoes, and Nahum sadly saw that his entire crop was lost. Quick to connect events, he declared that the meteorite had poisoned the soil and thanked heaven that most of the other crops were in the upland lot along the road. Winter came early and was very cold. Ami saw Nahum less often than usual and observed that he had begun to look worried. The rest of his family, too, seemed to have grown taciturn and were far from steady in their church-going or their attendance at the various social events of the countryside. For this reserve or melancholy, no cause could be found, 
though all the household confessed now and then to poorer health and a feeling of vague disquiet. Nahum himself gave the most definite statement of anyone when he said he was disturbed about certain footprints in the snow. They were the usual winter prints of red squirrels, white rabbits, and foxes. But the brooding farmer professed to see something not quite right about their nature and arrangement. He was never specific but appeared to think that they were not as characteristic of the anatomy and habits of squirrels and rabbits and foxes as they ought to be. Ami listened without interest to this talk until one night when he drove past Nahum's house in his sleigh on the way back from Clark's Corners. There had been a moon, and a rabbit had run across the road and the leaps of that rabbit were longer than either Ami or his horse liked. The latter, indeed, had almost run away when brought up by a firm rain. Thereafter, Ami gave Nahum's tales more respect, and wondered why the gardener dogs seemed so cowed and quivering every morning. They had, it developed, nearly lost the spirit to bark. 